Hi everyone, welcome to Sunday's Other Scriptures for August 6th. I'm going to be preaching on the Gospel lesson, which is taken from uh, Matthew 14. It's the account of the feeding of the 5,000, a very familiar story. And I'm going to be talking about how Jesus, through this uh, miracle, encourages his disciples to trust in God's provision and to be ambitious in what their goals are, not just to uh, do the easy thing, but to do the thing that uh, demonstrates the power of God's kingdom. Our Old Testament reading for the morning, and I think I've mentioned that very often the Old Testament reading is chosen to uh, line up with the gospel reading, so you can see the kind of prediction of, of the New Testament of the gospel in the Old Testament. And the reading is from Isaiah chapter 55, the first five verses. In it, God speaks through his prophet Isaiah and says, Come to me, all who are thirsty, come to the waters, and you who have no money, come buy and eat. So you can hear that this uh, God is using this analogy of people's physical uh, thirst and hunger and comparing it to Israel's thirst and hunger for uh, God, really, for uh, the divine, for uh, his blessing. And yet, uh, Israel has turned away from God, and they've turned to false gods uh, who promise uh, easy and pleasurable existence, but because they're false gods, of course, they can't deliver. And um, God instead directs them to his word and to his covenant with David. Now, the covenant with David was uh, God's covenant, uh, his promise to David that one of David's descendants would have an unbreakable rule, would sit on David's throne and rule forever. Uh, this was the promise of the Messiah, which means the anointed one. Uh, it gets translated in Greek as the Christ. It's the very prediction of the Christ. And so in this verse, God through Isaiah is encouraging people not to be satisfied with legalistic religion, not to be satisfied with uh, pragmatic false religion, but instead to come to him and to trust his word that he will someday send the Messiah who will satisfy all their physical hungers. And not just theirs, not just Israel's, but this is uh, for the nations. Uh, in verse 5 it says, Surely you will summon nations you do not know, uh, and nations that you do not know will hasten to you because of the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel. Well, we happen to live in a nation that the ancient Israelites didn't know. We live in the nation, the United States of America, North America. Uh, none of the nations in what was called the New World uh, were known to ancient Israel. And yet many people in the New World, both Northern and Southern Hemisphere, uh, have come and had their spiritual hunger fed by Christ the Messiah. So that's the tie-in with the Old Testament reading. The uh, psalm for the day is uh, take is Psalm 136. It's the end of a section of psalms known as the Halal Psalms. Halal is the Hebrew word for praise. So Hallelujah is praise Yahweh, the the sacred name of God. And this uh, concluding psalm at the end of the Halal section has a refrain in it uh, that's very repetitive. It is, uh, his love endures forever. Or if you're, depending on your version of the Bible, it might say his mercy endures forever. Now notice that there are, in this section, just the first five verses of Psalm 136, there are two different categories of things for which God is thanked and his love is praised. And the first one is God's character. It's who God is. And I point that out because so often, if we bother to give thanks to God, we thank him for what we have received, right? I'm not saying that's a bad thing, and, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to stop celebrating Thanksgiving or anything. But most of the time, if people remember to thank God, they, they ask him for things way more than they thank him. And when they do thank him, it's because it benefited me. But notice the beginning of this psalm is not about giving thanks to God for what he has done. It's giving thanks to God for who he is, right? That give thanks to the Lord for he is good. 
even if he weren't good to us, he would still be good. He's the definition of good, right? Give thanks to the God of gods. He's greater than all the gods. Give thanks to him for that. Uh, give thanks to the Lord of Lords, all the earthly lords and overlords and warlords and so on. He's the one who will ultimately hold them account. That's how this starts out. And then it goes into uh, his great wonders. And uh, the wonders that are described here are his creation of the earth, of the, the earth and the sun and the moon. It's the beginning of the creation account. Long before it ever gets to the animals or gets to humans, God is still praiseworthy because he has created the universe. So uh, I, I don't know that this ties directly in with the feeding of the 5,000, but there is this tendency to praise God in the feeding of the 5,000 because the people got their hunger satisfied. But of course, the bigger miracle here is that the Son of God himself came down to earth and had compassion on people and met all their needs. The bigger miracle is that God himself, the creator of heaven and earth, cares for us. So that's how I would tie that in. Now, our reading from Romans is, is even tougher. It's part of that Lectio Continuo, that continuous reading through Romans this time of year. And in it, Paul is writing to those in Rome, and he makes a really startling statement uh, so startling that he starts out by saying, I speak the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. Um, he says, I have great sorrow and anguish in my heart, for I could wish that I myself were cursed or cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, those of my own race, the people of Israel. What's Paul saying here? He's saying that he would be willing to be cursed by God and cut off from Christ. He would, in fact, be willing to be damned if it would result in in all of his fellow Jews coming to salvation through the Messiah, the fulfillment of that covenant with David through Christ. I mean, that's an amazing amount of love that Paul has for his fellow Jews. For, he goes on to say, you know, they have the adoption as sons, theirs is the divine glory, the, the covenant, the receiving of the law, the temple worship, the promises, all these valuable ways in which God revealed himself to people on earth. There's are the patriarchs, uh, and there's from them is traced the human ancestry of Christ. So the Jews ought to be the ones who are most blessed by the coming of Christ, the Messiah, in fulfillment of the covenant with David. But, in verse 6, Paul says uh, that it's not as though God's word has failed, and yet not all who are descended from Israel are Israel. And uh, the, the sentence here is meant to convey not all who are descended from Israel, which was the name given to Jacob uh, after he had wrestled with God. He was renamed. His original name was um, Jacob means uh, he pulls the leg. Uh, you know, we would say, you're pulling my leg. Uh, it meant trickster, someone who, who pulls your leg or, or trips you up. Uh, because Jacob relied on his own wit to uh, trick his brother Esau and uh, to trick his uncle Laban, and he ultimately came to understand that he couldn't trick God, that he had to rely on God and trust God. And after wrestling with God, uh, you know, physically wrestling with God and, and spiritually over this, he's given a new name, which is Israel, which means he wrestles with God. And so what Paul is saying is it's not all who are descended from Jacob, the physical Israel who wrestles with God, who are Israel, the people of God. It's actually, and this is part of a larger context, it's actually those who trust in God by faith, who are the real Israel. And Paul makes this point, uh, which is startling in Romans, but he makes it only after saying that he wishes it, he's, it's not against his fellow Jews. He would you know, give his own salvation if it could save his fellow Jews. If it could turn them to the Messiah, he would be cut off. So it's not that he hates Jews at all. He's one of them and he loves them. But uh, he is making the point that the children of God, the children of the promise uh, given to Abraham are those who, like Abraham, uh, trust in God, 
who uh, believe God and it's credited to them as righteousness. It's part of a larger argument for Jews and Gentiles alike that we are saved and included in the family of God, not by birth into the physical bloodline of Abraham, not by being Jewish, not even by taking on the Jewish festivals and, and practices and laws, but by trusting God as Abraham did long before the law was ever given. So Paul uses uh, these two examples. One is of, of Isaac. Uh, Abraham has promised that through Isaac, his offspring will re be reckoned. Why is that? Well, because God had made this promise that a descendant of Abraham and Sarah would be the child of the promise, the one who would be the first of a great nation of descendants of Israel, of Abraham and Sarah. And uh and, but Abraham and, and uh, Sarah try to uh, take a shortcut. They have Abraham sleep with Sarah's maidservant, and she bears him his firstborn son, Ishmael. But God tells him, Ishmael's not, uh, you know, I'm going to bless him too, but he's not the child of the promise. So Israel, uh, I'm sorry, Isaac, the child of Abraham and Sarah, who comes along later, is actually the child of the promise. He's the one whom Abraham and Sarah had to just trust God, that God would provide. And so it's, it's Israel, not all the Arab nations descended from Ishmael, who are the chosen people in, under the old covenant. Uh, Paul goes on and gives a second example of God uh, providing a child of the promise. And this time it is uh, Jacob himself, Jacob who was uh, descended from his father Isaac, and, and was a twin. And his older brother Esau came first. And Esau, again, as the firstborn child, should have been the child of the promise. But it was predicted even before Jacob and Esau were born that the older would serve the younger. And sure enough, Jacob starts out trying to trick his brother Esau into giving him his inheritance. I mean, he, he does do that. But it's actually because of God's promise that he ends up being the ancestor of of the of the Jewish people and the ancestor of Christ. And the point here, which is uh, maybe a little bit lost on us Gentiles who aren't as deeply steeped in the lore of the Old Testament, but the point that Paul is making for the Jewish people is that it's the promise of God and our faith in the promise of God that's everything. It's not at all about bloodline that God's favor is reckoned. And, and this is a good thing for those of us, again, who are, who are Gentiles, who are not of at uh, Jacob's, uh, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob's bloodline, right? Th so this is the big point he's making. Now, how does this relate to the feeding of the 5,000? Well, Jesus in the feeding of the 5,000, uh, it's not the practical uh, work of his disciples, the 12 disciples, in using their own means, which their idea was just to send people away and have people do it for themselves, go buy some food. Uh, Jesus actually provides food for them that is miraculously provided. It's food of the promise. And in fact, there are 12 basket loads uh, picked up afterwards by the 12 disciples, a clear sign that this was a miracle for the 12 tribes of Israel, because the apostles were the new 12 tribes, that God would do above and beyond what they expected, and he would do it through his own promises, not through their pragmatism. And this is the lesson for us, because it encourages us to do uh, bolder things for God, to open our minds to the possibility that he wants to do much greater things in our lives than what we ourselves can ask or imagine. So that's just a brief overview of our verses. I hope that the Lord blesses your discussion of these uh, readings this week. The Lord be with you.